Um, I want to start by, by revisiting this, this issue of functional versus prescriptive specifications because I'm, I'm acutely aware that um, some people hear the word functional specification and they think that everything's being done in, in a rather loose way. And I want to try and um, explore that issue a little bit more and see actually when Mike, for instance, was talking about functional specs, he's talking about functional specs at the top level cascading down to, to more prescriptive specifications, which are their established specifications, rather than having to go through a process of new specifications for every project. So, Mike, could you just expand on that theme? Because I know we had some questions from, from Jeff Davidson in the audience and others, so uh, perhaps you could expand on that, Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, so if we take the example, um, uh, I think uh, Till mentioned the, <coughs> the, the biggest FPSO uh, owner in the world works uh, pretty much exclusively, exclusively for least FPSOs with functional specs. The, the specs that they will typically come out with um, are maybe 100 pages uh, long for a billion dollar asset. That includes uh, the reservoir requirements, uh, the, uh, the met ocean requirements, but it includes some specific things like the interfaces for the, uh, the offloading system, uh, for the riser system. So they define their interfaces they define what's coming in, what they want out, and the rest is left to, to the contractor. What they also have then is a contract which backs that up, which is very uh, performance orientated. So if you produce, you get paid. If you don't produce, you don't get paid. Uh, pretty much uh, no carrots and a big stick. So the, the way they protect uh, their interest is making sure that, um, that uh, the contractor does his job because he knows that he has to deliver to get paid. And that's, uh, that's a mechanism which, it's a bit, it's a bit severe, but uh, it works um, in a, of a fashion. But uh, the, it relies then on the contractor to come with, uh, with their uh, technical specifications to define how they're going to translate the client's <coughs> functional specs into the final product and make sure that they can deliver the contract obligations. Okay. Uh, perhaps just picking up a point that Teal made about uh, you know, doing, doing the same thing over and over again. Um, Mike, you mentioned, I, 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 perhaps we're, we're just not naming names, but I think most people understand the sort of general technical description that we're talking about, and I think a lot of us have seen the same document going through a number of projects and evolving over time. And the operator that we're, we're, um, we're sort of skirting around the name of, we are, we're, we're all familiar that they've been doing this over and over again, and they've, they've matured their specifications. So going back to the point that you made, uh, Teal, they're doing the same thing over and over again and getting better at doing what they're doing. Can you just expand on that a little bit and explain how you can see the use of functional specs being, being beneficial? Uh, yeah, is is you know, also, um, well, the repetition, actually, I would say that operator is probably the only one in the world that has enough of a mass of FPSOs to be able to come up with something that is very repeatable. Okay, what I do want to say, and is, is and for example, uh, um, there are, so, so I'm diverging, but I'm saying there are limits not to the notion of functional specification, but there are limits to the repeatability. Okay? The functional specification is, is essentially, you know, I don't want to repeat everything that's being said this morning, is, is, uh, uh, you know, is just a, the, the approach to saying, no, this is what I want. I want a four-door car that has a two-liter engine that will do, you know, 100 miles an hour and move the without uh, specifying the paint and the engine, and then letting us get on at the business. Now, if you as a client can do this repeatably, then indeed um, you can hone the specification. If you build a relationship with a small number of clients, they can get better. And then there is value in it for everybody. Uh, of course, you know, there is limits to the repeatability. If you, for example, look at our fleet, I can assure you that, you know, or Yumka Knapp that handles over, you know, can handle, you know, all for almost, you know, half billion barrels a day, you know, 500, a million, half a million barrels a day. And Athena, that's a small boat in the North Sea, is, you know, very little in comparison. So that's, that's the limits, is the clients actually come to us with a very wide range of uh, requests, which then they can still come with a functional spec, but the repeatability goes away. So then the repeatability goes at the next level. This is what we do share and what we are focusing on at BW Shore 
is we repeat our processes. We have a repeatability in, in at the next level down in how we put the bits together. We know how to go through the routine. We haven't done as many projects as uh, SBM has, but we have you know, over 30 and we have a stable of engineers. And so that is then where the repeatability comes in. Whereas if you're an oil company and you're going to do three FPSOs in 15 years, you can't get this repeatability. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Hassan, anything you'd like to add in terms of uh, your, your, your thoughts and experience on functional versus prescriptive specs? Yeah, th thanks. Uh, um, I, I think uh, the question of repeatability versus functional spec is, is actually a question of survival. In today's uh, market, uh, we've seen uh, many, most of us, uh, ending up with the wrong projects, uh, ending up with the overruns. And frankly speaking, at uh, $60 oil, we have no option but to f shoot for functional specs and repeatability. It's the only way we're going to cope with the demands coming out of the oil company. The oil companies are going to squeeze us uh, for margins, and we, uh, the answer to that has to be standardization, functional spec, repeatability for survival. I mean, they do that for oil rigs, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they don't go to Transocean and tell them what they want to do. They just take a standard design and say, you punch several holes and that's what I pay you for. Now, why can't that be the case in FPSOs? Why do they have to breathe down our necks all the time with 90 people on the yard versus 90 people on the contractor side? basically dictating everything that's going on. So I'm fully um, supportive of the two gentlemen uh, going forward that it's it's not a question of w whether it's functional or whether it's a survival uh, question today. If we don't do it, uh, I'm afraid I have a, a dim view of the future of the FBSO actually. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Hassan. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll save that question for later to take back to the audience and particularly those of you who are from operators to, uh, to perhaps um, <coughs> Uh, relay Hassan's question as to as to why you feel the need to breathe down the neck, but we'll come back to that later. Um, I just want to give uh, Frederick the opportunity just 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 to uh, to talk a bit about functional versus prescriptive, and then I want to move on to perhaps a little bit about technology and and uh, and again start uh, the technology discussion with Frederick. But Frederick, anything on prescriptive versus functional? <coughs> From our side, first, of is this working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. From, from uh, Savant's side, I would just want to say we are in a slightly different position than uh, my friends uh, over here, since we're currently a technology provider. We, we are not uh, dealing directly with the, with the, the contracts. Um, that's only for the situations where the oil companies are uh, selecting to own the FPSO. But uh, still, uh, I fully support the idea of, uh, of relying on the functional specifications and uh, that's even more on our side since uh, we have a different FPSO and with the, the detailed prescriptions uh, we're, we're running into problems uh, with, a, with a different concept and uh, so for the, for, from that perspective uh, I think the relying on the functional specifications makes uh, a lot of sense. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Thank you. So, I want to move on now and, and, and talk a little bit about technology. There, there are a couple of questions I want to pose to the panel about uh, about technology. We heard earlier about the fact that uh, um, perhaps we'll see new emerging disruptive technologies. So, I'm, I'm going to start with Frederick and ask um, with, from the technology that they've already developed. Do you see new ideas, and have you any uh, anything you'd like to to share with us about how you see new technology? allowing us to meet some of the challenges of this low price environment. Yeah, that, that's a thing that has not been covered this morning. And uh, I, I think, uh, as I said, I fully support the, the basics of what was said here. But beyond that, there is also a potential for optimizing the technology. And what we have tried to do is, is to follow that route. And uh, the, the people in, uh, in Savant Marine, they, uh, the core people, they all came from the turret and swivel business. So uh, what we asked ourselves is, is this the, the most sensible way of, of making a floating production unit with, with a ship-shaped unit? Could, could it be done differently and still provide the massive storage of oil? And uh, so that was the background for this, to, to take out this part of the unit, which certainly... Uh, 
uh, contains uh, quite a lot of the, the cost picture and also uh, complication and uh, limiting the flexibility of the unit. And what we're seeing, uh, starting off with the FPSO and the drilling units, is that uh, new applications are popping up where, where we see benefits on the development cost. I can mention one, one area is where you want to, to deal with dry wellheads on moderate water depths, where you're able to uh, create one unit rather than two if you're, uh, if you're building a field development with a wellhead platform, which obviously is giving quite significant cost reductions. Another area is in an area where you have uh, turret moored ships, uh, turret moored FPSOs, there might be a desire to add well access from your, uh, from your floater. And again, if you are turret moored, that's not possible. You cannot do it. You cannot drill through a turret. Uh, if, you're if you're moored in fixed orientation, you can combine production and drilling and then put your uh, well access equipment on board the floater. So that's the kind of things we're looking for when, we, when we're dealing with a differently <coughs> shaped unit. It's not just for fun. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. Um, I, I want to stay on the same theme of, of new technology, and uh, Mike, I, I know this is a conversation that you, have, you and I have had before um, about, uh, about process intensification. Um, uh, process intensification is, 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 is really about trying to do an awful lot more with, with, with less equipment, uh, less equipment count, smaller equipment, and so forth. Um, could I ask you just to, just to give us some thoughts on how you see process intensification helping us to, uh, to, again, overcome some of the challenges. Yeah. Um, just before I do, can I just respond to sure, a absolutely. comment from yeah. Frederick? Yeah. Um, uh, well, first of all, drilling through a turret, yes, you can. I mean, we, we've got one on the, the drawing board for that, uh, so those, uh, that can be done. Um, and when you get to things like prelude, um, you know, you, there is no option. Vessels, uh, some vessels need to weather vane. You, you uh, for uh, something in that environment where you have a massive uh, top sides, a massive storage requirement, and you need to stay permanently connected during uh, uh, huge uh, cyclonic events, then um, you, know, you, you need to weather them. But anyway, let's not uh, let's not dwell on that. Process intensification. I mean, we we have. Um, I think I touched on this. Uh, we, we see on the simplification slide that uh, top sides are getting bigger and bigger all the time, and they're getting more complicated um, because of the additional processing requirements, uh, for the, particularly on the gas side. So to, to turn the, the curve back around and, and come back down again in terms of uh, what weight do you need uh, per thousand barrels of oil production, uh, something has to change. And uh, that's where process intensification can come in. Uh, how do you achieve the same processing uh, requirement with uh, with a smaller footprint, with a smaller equipment. But that also comes to the point I was raising about uh, qualification. So there's lots of great technology out there which could do that tomorrow, but someone has to get it qualified offshore. And uh, that's a big risk for an FPSO contractor to take when you've got a hugely penalizing lease contract on your back. So the, you need to somehow work uh, together with the oil companies <coughs> to get that qualification process and get that technology offshore. And uh, there's a huge prize there, but uh, it's, it's not being uh, properly, uh, it's not being fast-tracked today. Yeah. Have, have, um, have the subsea, um, uh, subsea not, not as a collective, the subsea supply chain, have they been more innovative in terms of, of developing new process technologies than, than perhaps we have in terms of floaters? In terms of uh, new technology, there is some interesting subsea technology that could be used on top sites for sure, mm. but um, it's it's very much customised. There's absolutely zero standardisation subsea from what uh, from what I can see. Mm. Uh, even Christmas trees are uh, customised uh, to a large extent. So um, uh, the, the the key is uh, getting the the new technology, but also then trying to standardise as well and not to customise for every project. So uh, yes, yeah, on compact. Uh, Separation, compact compression, uh, that could have a role to play on uh, on top sides. Um, but uh, again, it has to be qualified for FPSO use, not subsea use. Yeah. Okay. Teal, um, technology. Do you see any any major disruptive technologies coming around the corner that could uh, could help us and, and 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 provide clients with more cost-effective solutions? Well. Um uh, our view and our effort on technology is, of course, everybody's always looking for the disruptive technology, but uh, 
the the real I think the holy grail in where we are working is uh, uh, more the sort of evolution that we have seen in cars or such or in electronics which is that uh, every generation only marginally seems a little bit different than the previous but then if you then stop and look at what it looked like 15 years ago you realize, realize through how much change you have gone and so this is the so it's more like the incremental improvement technology approach uh, we have you know that's great about the current environment two projects gone and before I had half a guy on technology and now I have 20 so that's very good uh, so but yes uh, we're we we've had plans and now they're finally moving forward on uh, certain things we want to do with new built hulls we're definitely much more keen on new built hulls than our competitors have been so far although you know Modek has done a new built hull as well um, we are um, we are looking at certain aspects of uh, uh, you know how we design our process plants, but uh, again uh, we have a much smaller part of our fleet you know concentrated in the place where you get uh, 20 years out of one unit. We have a larger part of our fleet that's exposed to residual value, so we are uh, uh, planning to spend some effort on designing process plants that are shall I say. <coughs> more adaptable because you know the problem I've given presentations like I did today explaining why the redeployable FPSO doesn't exist and we're actually trying to uh, address that from a process standpoint because that's always you get a field you know if you get a field with low pressure heavy oil requiring lots of heat and then you come to another field and suddenly it's high pressure your process plant is gone or vice versa so we're trying to address this in a, in, in a smart way. And then there's, uh, like cars, there are lots of expensive bits and pieces on various parts of the FPSOs. And, you know, any one of them, okay, and you save half a million here and you save two million there. But then remember, the half of the FPSO is kit you buy. If you can, you know, save bits and pieces left and right eventually. And so this is also where we are looking. Okay, And this is also where we are having a continuing dialogue with vendors to see what they are coming up with. And is, is, as long as those vendors talk to my engineers and not to me, okay? So the message is that you want, you want the, uh, the vendors to befriend your colleagues on LinkedIn, but not you. Yeah, well, you know, my engineers have to keep busy, you know. I have to sit in airplanes, so... Okay, and, and uh, Hazan, anything, anything you'd like to add on, on uh, I'm, technology I'm story? I'm a bit concerned uh, hearing what uh, my colleagues are saying, actually, because it seems to be all sort of uh, baby steps and uh, uh, incremental uh, <coughs> rather than uh, game-changing. Uh, I think my message to, the, to, the, to my colleagues here is that unless we do something drastic, uh, there will not be an industry, I'm sorry. Uh, it's $60 oil. Uh, we're still talking about incremental. We need step changes. Nobody's talking about alternate materials, for example, although we use it on the 787. Uh, nobody's using automation, for example. There's hundreds of kilometers of cables that are not required, okay? Uh, so those are the kind of changes that we will be advocating and to say you need to do not baby steps but radical steps. That's what happened with shale. Eventually it came up and it destroyed the whole uh, the whole uh, industry. We need to be thinking along those lines. I would like to challenge Taylor, of course, about the relocatability. It's the holy grail. But I think perhaps the time is ripe today for a relocatable FPSO by changing the mindset of oil companies and saying, if you want your $60 oil to work, you've got to work with us and stop breathing down our necks and start accepting um, standardization across the uh, across the industry. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, Hassan. Uh, just just uh, 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 moving on to another topic then, and uh, if I may, I'll stay with you, Hassan, and start start this one with you because uh, I want to move away from technical now and just just talk a little bit about finance and the risks associated with finance because I know that uh, you know the other part of the equation with at least three of the gentlemen on, on, on the panel is is they're providing these facilities and as well as providing the facilities and delivering what uh, what our clients want, whether it's prescriptive or functional, 
Uh, they also have to find ways to fund these projects, and the people who are funding them are concerned about risk. So the question I want to ask, uh, starting with you, Hassan, is, is we had a question earlier this morning about is it possible to finance these projects. Mike gave us quite a, quite a useful but quite quick answer, so I want to expand on that. So, A, do you see it possible to finance projects? And if so, what are the major risks that the people who are providing finance are concerned about when they're, when they're reviewing the project and, uh, and reviewing the financeability of a project? Yeah, uh, I, I need to be careful what I say here. I just haven't stepped uh, down from my uh, former position. This is my view, okay, rather than, uh, than uh, my previous employer's <coughs> view. Uh, you're going to see two trends here. You're going to see the big project trends, which is the, say, uh, pre-source at one and a half, two billion and, and, and above. And those kind of things are just not sustainable. Uh, from a contractor point of view, they need huge balance sheets, uh, and it's a money machine. Uh, and frankly speaking, the equity regeneration is just not fast enough. Uh, note uh, what Modec is doing, they're backed by JBEC, uh, that's a printing machine. Um, I hear our colleague was also uh, thinking of uh, doing some funds. and So it basically, the big projects are going to be financed by, by, by infrastructure funds. That's that's almost an inevitable uh, position that I see. On the medium to small ones, yes, there is a market there for leased FPSOs because the medium uh, contracts will require us to, to finance them because we provide them cheaper money. But is that the smart way from a risk point of view uh, for us to finance an oil company because they're really asking us to hedge their business? So we are now turning also to, to funds like uh, First Reserve and other people, and say, like Petrofac did, for example, and, and, and say, you know, why don't you uh, take over the majority of the finance and leave us with 20, 30 percent? So I think you'll see going forward a different financing regime, and it's actually going to determine what happens to this industry. Uh, and I see a two, uh, two tier, uh, the large and, and, and the small. Uh, so the conventional FPSO as we really knew it, um, I don't know. I mean, is there going to be such a thing uh, conventional that we finance it and we take residual value or we take the risk and, and OPCK? I'm not sure that's going to be the case going forward. Uh, that's uh, an opinion. Mike, Mike, interesting, uh, interesting challenge there. Well, I don't, uh, I don't agree. Um, I think on the the large FPSOs, I mean that uh, that can be a sustainable business model uh, if you have the balance sheet to um, to to back up those projects. Um, we've uh, we've done uh, four large pre-sold FPSOs. Uh, we uh, we hope to do more. Um, we have different financing mechanisms in place uh, for those. Uh, of course, we we don't uh, take those 100% on our own shoulders. We do those with uh, with financial partners, um, or or also um, operational partners in some cases. Um, but uh, yes, they are they are more challenging. And uh, the taking your point about uh, what are the risk profiles that uh, the financial uh, bodies are looking for. I mean, the, the, the risks are right through the, uh, the project, from the reservoir risks. Uh, so do they, do they think that the field is actually there? Um, to the execution risk, uh, to the operational risk, uh, to the client risk, to the political risk, to the country risk. Uh, um, you know, there's a long, long list of uh, things which we have to, to go through to satisfy the, the, uh, the lenders that, uh, that it's a robust project. And that's, that means that they can be selective. So it's much easier to, to finance robust projects, obviously, than it is to, to finance marginal projects in uh, difficult locations with uh, small operators. That's just a, a fact of life. Yeah. yeah. OK. And, and in terms of the way in which the financing model, I mean, I think Hassan was saying that the, we, we may see the, 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 the structure of the financing model uh, evolve over time. Do you, and you mentioned that you're working with partners on some of the larger projects. Do, do you see that evolving over time? Do you see a, 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 can you see any, any particular themes that will, uh, will, will dictate how that will evolve over time? I mean, we have a financial team who are uh, always uh, looking for innovative new ways to, to raise finance. So uh, um, I'm not going to go into all the things they're looking at, but uh, there are uh, a number of innovative ways of raising finance, and yes, and that's, uh, that's part of the, the, the game, uh, finding uh, the, the best ways and the most competitive uh, ways uh, of uh, financing a project. 
It, it raises an interesting question, and this may be a rhetorical question, so feel free to dodge it if you wish. But, but I just wonder whether it's the uh, you know us exploring on the contractor side, exploring ways in which we can we can finance project. Is 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 that what we uh, set out to do? Is it, it's like the old parable of, of, you know, we started off draining the swamp and we killed alligators because they were a pest, and now we're alligator hunters rather than uh, sw swamp drainers. I, I just wonder whether, and as I say, it is a rhetorical question, is, is that what we, uh, are we doing that out of necessity or because it's, it's, um, it, it's the way our clients feel it's most economic to uh, deliver these projects? I, I think it's both. I think we're trying to provide a service to our clients. Yeah, which, which includes um, uh, financing of their um, the, the floating asset. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I would say more than that is, you know, reality is, is we've been doing this for so long. We've gotten good at it. We have networks just as much as, and, uh, you know, we know that on many of these projects, in the right circumstance for all the conditions and the criteria, is we can actually do better than our clients. Okay, we, we can provide the service that uh, they cannot get themselves. It's true, it's difficult. It's true that, you know, like Hassan said, it's, it's a challenge for all of us to keep the equity generation and the capex that we have to deploy versus a stream of projects. It's a perpetual challenge. But, you know, we, <laughs> the problem is, is between seeing what you can do, what you need to do and being able to do it is sometimes, well, what, what do I mean? Like, you know, is, is there's also, you know, an important aspect in our business is actually how many projects are finance and how many projects are EPC projects. Because, you know, the simplest way for us to generate equity is to do an EPC project and not lose money on it because that, you know, because then, then, then everything fails. But if you have the right balance with EPC where you take the, pro the, uh, the other things that is, is, you know, some of our clients, we do hybrid models, okay? We have to come up with 20, 30% uh, equity. Well, we go to the client, we'll finance 70, but you come up with the 20, 30% and you pay it up front. So this I'm being simplistic, but we have, you know, I don't have to say they're, they're amongst, you know, some of the people who are not at the table have different financing arrangements, you know, with uh, U.S. dentists and bankers and, you know, so uh, there is a whole industry there and we've developed our skill at using that financial tool just as much as we've developed our skill at uh, our technical tools and it's a service we offer. Yeah, it's hard, yeah, sure, but uh, it's a service we offer. Okay, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and, and Frederick, just um, uh, not necessarily finance because I understand the differences between your business model and, and, and the others, but, uh, but, but in terms of um, execution models, perhaps we can broaden it out to that. Uh, any, any thoughts and observations on how execution models for, for, for projects going forward uh, in your view, will, uh, will, will help things in the future? Well, um, um, I, I heard what uh, Till said earlier today, and um, it makes, again, a lot of sense, because you have a line through the whole process from, from the start to the end, and uh, that is something we have observed. If you don't have that, then you may run into, and you are running into severe problems. If you have too many different players with different interests in your project, then uh, it will create discontinuities in, um, in the whole development. But uh, relating to, uh, to financing, I think, to me, uh, and we did this earlier, and we did it in the days, in, uh, in the happy old days, or what you should call it. And uh, we've been in a situation where the oil company went broke when we were hooked up at the field. Uh, having um, ballooned their reserves for their banks. So the shitty small oil companies, it's a situation you, might you may wind up in, in. And that was the game that reduced the number of players, as uh, Till mentioned here. And it would have reduced us too if we didn't have unique technology, that's for sure. But um, we have seen situations where the oil company has uh, had financial strength and they looked into whether they were going to lease or, um, or own the FPSO. And uh, in that case, uh, it's obvious, if the oil company has the execution force 
and uh, they're sitting on all the information on the field. Um, in some, some situations, it doesn't make sense to them to, to get the external financing. It will, by nature, add cost to it. Of course, it will reduce their risk, but it will add cost. So it's a consideration that you will see there. And I'm also a little bit surprised, Mike, what you're saying, because I've seen your ads, and I think it's saying take it or lease it. But, um, and I assume you're also in situations where you're actually uh, dealing with, uh, with operator-owned FPSOs in the moment. Yeah, sure. I mean, we we do uh, roughly seventy percent lease, thirty percent EPC. So uh, we we will supply uh, either EPC or EPCIO or a hybrid where we uh, we deliver EPC, <coughs> operate for three years, and then hand over. So it's just horses for courses, depending on what the client wants. But to continue on that, uh, um, we have seen uh, very different type oil companies dealing with uh, with oil company owned uh, FPSOs. And uh, it requires a strength in the oil company to uh, to carry out the uh, the, pro the uh, to lead the project execution throughout the process and and be there and have those resources in house. If they don't, it, it, it might very easily wind up in a in a very fluffy situation. So. Um, it's uh, it's part of uh, the the situation where you see that if there are different players in the different stages of an FPSO project, the you, there are great losses in the discontinuity between the different stages, and uh, we've certainly seen that. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Um, I want to go back briefly to um, to, to a, a, a topic that uh, Teal raised a few minutes ago. Um, as, as consultants, one of the, the, there are two questions we get asked probably more than any other two questions. And uh, as consultants, obviously, we're happy to answer that question over and over again. As long as you get but, paid, <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, yeah. And to get paid over and over again for doing it. Um, and I can't resist the temptation as I've got, I've got people uh, on the panel who are, who are clearly um, ha have a huge amount of expertise in this area. And, and it comes back to new build versus conversion. The other question we get is lease versus buy. But... Uh, but we've already dealt with that to a degree. So I want to come back to the new build versus conversion question. Um, Teal, you mentioned that, uh, that BW as an organization is, 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 is perhaps moving a bit towards uh, new builds. So I'd like you to perhaps uh, give some of the reasons why now you're <coughs> moving a bit towards new builds, and then perhaps uh, Mike can come back and, and talk about their thoughts on conversions, and obviously they're, they're pursuing conversions. So Teal, if you could... Uh, just expand on, on your reasons for looking at new builds as opposed to conversions for certain projects and what the reasons are. Okay. Well, so the trigger, I'll be, you know, frank to say, is that the experience uh, BWO as a company has had has been that uh, the sole area where <coughs> it has had its problems in the projects have been with conversions of old clunkers. Okay. And... Uh, so uh, we kind of then migrated to an approach of using newer hulls. So we have by no means abandoned the conversion concept because you know quite recently we were going to do. We were unfortunately got cancelled not for oil price reasons, but we were going to do you know the largest gas FPSO in the world, and we were going to use the conversion. But the hull we were going to use was uh, never used new, uh, by now it was three-year-old VLCC. And of course, it, it removes, new hulls remove an entire uh, level of uncertainty, which you do have when you pick up, you know, conversions. Is that manageable? Yes. But there is also a great, uh, uh, shall I say, geographical uh, aspect to the decision. Let me explain this. Is so, you know, we, uh, mentioned this before, uh, three years ago we did a major feed for what, uh, uh, you know, a Nord Sea FPSO. Uh, we didn't win the bid and then the project didn't proceed anyway. Most of you probably know what it was, but our experience with that was, even then we had a very recent <coughs> role, was that uh, for the Metocean environment in the Nord Sea, the extent of conversion we had to do was so extensive that uh, we didn't, we didn't we very, that's when we decided if we do another North Sea hull, so another North Sea hull, we'll do a new build. 
Very different in West Africa and to some extent to Brazil, where uh, uh, you know the environment is mild, so you can pick up a hull and you have to do very little changes. So then the incentive to use an existing hull is bigger. But uh, certainly, is uh, you know, if you know, if, if it's up to us and some client comes for a 15, 20 year contract, even in West Africa, and it is is is. Uh, um, as long as we can get away, there is a schedule penalty still, although that's and you saw that in the slide I showed. There is still a schedule penalty, but even there, what we are basically working on, if you develop, if we can develop a battery of uh, hull designs, which you know we don't have in our pocket, but that is what we will be working on, then you kind of shorten because a big part of the cycle is in the design. And see, if we get away with a battery of new hull designs, then uh, and we've advanced tested it and developed our relationship with some shipyards, then uh, we think we can be uh, fairly competitive with new built hulls on long life, long life. Now, of course, if somebody comes to us for a 40,000 barrel a day, five year FPSO for West Africa, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to come up with a new build hull, you know, as, as uh, we're going to go look at something more dusty. Sorry, is it dusty, dusty or rusty? Well, yeah, maybe rusty, yes. <laughs> okay, um, well, that, that's, um, that's a view from, the, uh, from, from sort of the new build side. Mike, um, you've obviously, SBM have got a lot of experience doing, uh, doing conversions and doing conversions for projects that are running for quite a long design life. So perhaps you could put your side of your view as to how you manage conversions and manage them successfully. Well, firstly, I mean, I don't get the impression that we do only conversions. Maybe we've supplied three um, new build FPSOs. Mm. So again, it's, it's horses for courses. Um, there are three factors, I would say, and that is cost, the schedule, and this performance. So if you take performance, yeah, I fully agree, long design life, once you get to 25 years, you get to a, a point where the level of conversion uh, becomes so expensive and so uh, extensive that uh, you're better off on a new build. So there is a break point where uh, uh, on design life it, it starts to favor a new build. Um, on environment, uh, very severe environments where you have a lot of fatigue damage, uh, strength issues, then uh, that can also favor a new build. Um, so there are performance reasons why you, you may want to go that way. Um, on the schedule, uh, there's definitely a benefit on conversion. So uh, that's where schedule is important, then we would always try to, to stick with, uh, with the conversion. Um, and then on, on cost. And cost is a uh, function of the market. So tanker prices fluctuate, shipyard loading, and therefore new build pricing fluctuates. And uh, you can get p conditions uh, where the shipyards are so hungry that uh, new builds can actually be cheaper than a heavy conversion for a long design life. So, I mean, it's something that, uh, that we monitor on a regular basis, and uh, we have uh, strategies for both new builds and for conversions. Okay. In, terms of, in terms of the... Um, Teal showed a, a pie chart of, of, of how much the hull makes up. Uh, would, would you sort of broadly agree with those sort of numbers? I think, the, I think Teal had the hull as about 25% of, uh, of, of the cost of the whole FPSO project. Yeah, I think that was, a, you showed a billion dollar capex, so it's roughly 250 million for the hull. Um, it depends on the location, uh, the, uh, the, the spec that you need, to the design mm. life, etc. Yeah. But uh, you can easily spend more than 200 million on a hull if you buy a conversion and then you extensively refurbish it and modify it for long term. Yeah, because yeah, that, that hull has, you know, that includes the living quarters for the entire FPSO, that includes, you know, whatever machinery we have put in the engine room, so it, you know, it includes part of the turret, so it's, it's not, you can't compare it to a tanker. And we ourselves sometimes have a hard time comparing it to a conversion because the money sits in different bins, okay? And you have to, it's very hard when you do a conversion in a shipyard, so the, the comparison is, but for us, yeah, North Sea, high demand, 20 years. So, but the one thing I do want to say, there are differences, you know, or two major competitors have undeniably done a very large number of quasi-repeatable FPSOs for Brazil. We have not. So they've developed the skill, okay? So now we're, 
also faced with, well, do we want to catch up or do we want to do something else? And that is undeniably also playing in our approach of the new hope where, forget it, we'll go somewhere else because we don't think we'll lose any bids on it. And uh, what we do know is, uh, sorry, clients like new better than, you know, when faced with a choice at the same price. It's like, are you going to pick a new house or a modified house? Even, you know, if you buy it from somebody that's done 20 modified houses very well, we know when we go to a client and when it's like, you know, it's the new car. And uh, so I must say we can see, you know, some clients are willing to be, pay a premium just because it says new. And that's okay if they pay it to us, okay? <laughs> and, and Hassan, on, on, on the issue of new build versus conversion, any observations from your, your experience? Well, a lot of this has been uh, repeated and said, uh, well, I'd like to make two, two, or two or three points. Number one, if you go with a new build, you're limited to the yards you can go to. Uh, and therefore, from a balance of power, uh, you've got everything in the hands of the yard. Uh, many people have gone to new builds and they ended up in disaster projects. I don't want to mention the names of them, but you all know them. Uh, so so uh, remember, your option with conversion is far wider uh, and your maneuverability is far wider. Number two, uh, the top side has now become the critical path, uh, 30,000 tons. You know, that's where the cost is. Uh, these are all new anyway. So the argument about an old house versus new house, I mean, I think really it's going to boil down to money and schedule. Uh, and that depends on the market, as you rightly said. Um, two, three years ago, it was cheap to buy a VLCC, a two, three-year uh, VLCC. Today, it's in the roof, you know, so, so it's under 110 million. So it depends on the market, market conditions. Um, we in uh, Bumi Armada, uh, we took a four-year-old ice-class vessel for the North Sea. Um, and I can tell you, the, the cost is about 250 million, including the uh, turret. But we were 400 million cheaper and then the new build, and at least uh, seven to eight months uh, quicker. So again, in an environment of low oil, uh, I beg the question whether whether actually the oil company can afford new builds, uh, or whether the time is now uh, for conversions. But that's a question, a rhetoric question. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, so really, again, the question of new builds versus uh, it depends on the economics. Mike summed it up very well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So just, just two comments is, first of all, well, I agree with Hassan that unfortunately is there is quite a risk to put your hands yourself in at the mercy of one shipyard that has to deliver the hull. Okay, that's a measure of control you lose and then you depend on their performance. Whereas in a conversion yard, it's a, you're still at their mercy, but it's a different game. So I very much, I very much, uh, uh, agree with that. But just one caveat on the cost comparison is this, you know, I myself said also is, is you can't go, you know, we're looking at new hulls, not new turnkey FPSOs. The 400 million you were talking about is a turnkey FPSO and that's in line with my own premise when I said go to, you know, East Asian turnkey FPSOs pre-engineered and you're going to pay a fortune. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of that money is in the top sides in the way that the is, is, you know, to explain, I don't want to bang on those poor East Asian shipyards, but the reality, the reason why the products they deliver is so good is uh, they're actually, you know, totally, totally engineering everything. And then those shipyards, they're like, you know, is, they're like magical machines once they start producing. You know, everything is moving and things like that. But in reality, what they do, they're designing... I would say something like a car manufacturer does. They're designing something in full detail, and then what they do for the ships is they build many. So they go through all this process, but you know, for us it's only one time, and all this time and all this effort goes in this process, costs money, costs time, and yeah, it gives a very quality project, but you can't afford it. And we have a much more ad hoc way of putting things together, especially our top sides. And we, you know, all those East Asian yards, they could do things, you know, one after the other. And we do things like this, you know, in parallel. And we're used to it. And our fabricators are used to it. And, uh, and that is why we can do this. And that is where the 400 million comes, not yeah. from the hull. Yeah. 
And, and also the 90 clients next to you that uh, have a tendency to want to change and that disrupts uh, the flow of the art. My last point is new build versus conversion is obviously the East Asians are offering fantastic finance packages uh, today. And uh, that's not to be snubbed at, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, the, in, in IHI and, and other people, I mean, it's really worth looking at that because that could swing it one way or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah I absolutely agree. Um, Frederick, I, and it's probably a slightly unfair question for you on, on, on new bill versus conversion, but I don't know if there's anything you'd just like to add no. to. Uh... Um, yes, um, we have a couple of things to add. And, um, uh, all our units have, as was mentioned here earlier today, been built in uh, China. We have one unit being built in Korea, in fact, so we have a comparison. But starting to build our units in China, our ambition was to build the whole unit, including topside. And we at the early stage, this was back in the, in the middle of the 2000, 2005, something like that, <coughs> we found that they really couldn't do it. So we had to change the plan, uh, do the integration in Europe. So uh, what I want to touch on is the, is the split thing, because uh, the Chinese, they are really good at building hulls. And I would say the problem with the Far East Yards, Korean or Chinese, is that they're used to steel buildings, building hulls. They're not used to building topside and uh, deal with the specifications there. So um, what we did in the early stages, we built the hulls in China, we brought them to Europe, and we had the, the modules fabricated in skilled uh, fabrication yards around in, uh, in Europe, mainly in Norway, in fact, and we integrated in Holland. Which is good, but the problem is uh, when are you leaving the shipyard? Because <laughs> they are not finished when you leave the shipyard. You, the break point you have in the middle of this project is, is damaging to the whole uh, second contract. Because you will bring carryover work to the, to the next yard, and uh, carryover work is, uh, is work paid by, uh, by the volume you have of it, uh, so it'll be maximized by the yard, is what we have seen. So it's a different thing. So therefore, we are forcing work back to be done under one contract in, in one yard. That's our preference. But uh, it's not unproblematic, and I would say the main reason is the lack of skill for building topside in these yards. <laughs> But uh, if you look to China, uh, all the FPSOs that CNOC has in China, they are completely built in China. They're engineered and they've been working for many years. So uh, it, it's, it's doable. And um, for, from our perspective, it's probably more doable to, to get it done in China than in Korea. And that's mainly because of the flexibility and their willingness to look into new methods. So, so that's our finding, and uh, we, we've, str we've struggled both with China and with Korea. And, uh, but still, I think uh, if it's our preference, we would, we would uh, still rely on China. And of course, it's a, it's a big, big cost benefit building in China too. Okay. Yes, Mike. Can I, can I just add, um, on the, the last uh, couple of projects, we've actually built uh, quite a few modules in China. Um, quite successfully. You have to be careful, pick the right yard, uh, get the right supervision, but uh, yeah, it can be done. Then. Yeah. I, I uh, was a project director for uh, China FPSO, joined with CNOC in uh, 2002 before, and you know, and uh, I was a China FPSO, and then uh, the FPSO I talked about uh, <laughs> where we saved a quarter billion, actually, uh, I uh, took a competitor of mine now, but then a, a contractor to China in order to build the top sides there. So yeah, it is possible to build uh, the top sides uh, in China, but uh, where you go, how you manage it, how you manage the quality is important. And um, <coughs> yeah, the face value cost competitiveness is pretty good, but the bottom line is, you know, I'd say compared to what you get in Singapore, is not that big. And what I mean is you have to spend so many resources supervising. If you have complex uh, modules, and especially if you try to do integration in China, 
you end up sending so many vendors and experts and 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 getting into China can be a different and you know the Norwegians decide to give the Dalai Lama uh, a Nobel Prize that's it every Norwegian vendor you call it take three weeks before they get a visa you know it, you, you get you get all these all these problems and then you start adding up the bills and then you say "Ooh, you know I want to buy a hull here, but I'm going to be very careful. And, and there is, you know, you have to play this game tactically, and it goes like this. But, you know, anybody that thinks that the module in China is here and a module is there, if you include all the costs, you know, uh, I'm sorry. You know, when I do a module in Singapore, you know, uh, five minutes, I jump in the car, I drive to the yard, I yell at the boss, I come back, you know, try to do the same in China, and, and then he won't even understand when I yell. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Teal. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left before lunch. Uh, I've been told that lunch uh, food will be ready at 1.15, so I want to throw it open to, uh, to, to, to questions from the floor now. You've, uh, we, we've, we've had a fairly good canter around some of the key issues uh, uh, confronting FBSOs uh, at the moment, so I now want to invite questions from the floor. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to, uh, to Hassam's question of why all companies feel the need to breathe down the contractor's neck. If anybody wants to pick that one up, more than happy to, uh, to hear from them. So, questions from the floor, please. Yes. <clears throat> uh, please, if you could state your name and company and who the question's for, please. Um, my name's Gabriel Diaz. I work for uh, Weir Group. Uh, it's a general question, so anyone can answer. Do you see a difference in operation or maintenance cost uh, regarding where the top sides were built? The, the end of the discussion was on part China, part Singapore, part, and then some in Norway and everything that happens. But long term, like, well, I'll say five years, which is not long term, but five years, do you see a difference or what is the difference in operational maintenance costs? Uh, I, if, I mean, I would say that the main parameter for that question on operation and maintenance cost is Again, sorry, who designed and project managed uh, the project? Because uh, you can have parties in favorable areas uh, the deliver, you know, I mean, whether it's Europe or Singapore, deliver top sides that are very poor and very poorly maintained and of very poor durability. And, uh, you know, I have seen, well, I know I've been part of projects where modules were delivered from unlikely places, but very well managed, very well designed, and therefore had a very good operation. So it's, it's not about the yard, it's about who does it and how it does it. There is one more thing to that, and that is uh, the components you're selecting, allowing your, uh, your fabricators to use. Because in China, for, you have to be very, very careful with all down to the details of uh, of equipment being used. So if you're careful with that, the workmanship is, is good enough uh, normally. Mike? Yeah, I was going to say most of the, the operational <coughs> maintenance costs come from the equipment, not from the steel and the piping. Mm. So uh, the first thing is select the right vendors for the equipment, and that's what's going to govern your, your OPEX. And the, uh, the second thing is the um, you, for things like uh, coatings, you know, we have specifications, we know what coatings we require for the design life. The, the variable is just how much supervision you need to make sure you get it. Yeah. And uh, that's... Uh, yeah. I yeah. think the answer has to be in supervision. I think it's answered by a lot of my colleagues. Um, there was an example in Bumi where we worked with Class A contractors and we went offshore uh, only to find that uh, they've used their own gaskets. Um, the drawing was correct, the engineering was correct. Um, hell, there was even a checker, a checker who actually signed off on the drawing too. Uh, but it was the wrong gasket. Uh, gaskets, and therefore my answer to you is what Teal said and uh, what Mike said, supervision. Okay. Other questions? Yes, thank you. Pedro, uh, Pedro Patacão with ABB. Uh, I have a question regarding Brazil. Someone mentioned that uh, it's very unstable now it's happening with Petrobras. They have blacklisted some of the suppliers, that subcontractors they were using. 
Uh, what do you think will happen with the local content requirements? Mike, do you want to pick that one up? You're the Brazilian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> why, is, why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's not something I'm going to comment on uh, publicly like this. I mean, it's, uh, there is a process going on in Brazil. Uh, there are many companies involved in it. Uh, we have to wait and see what the um, what the legal process um, uh, comes up with at the end of the day. But I'm, I'm not at liberty to, to comment on that here. And but your question, as far as you know, what are Petrobras and all the authorities <laughs> going to do in terms of local content? No, nobody knows. Okay, I think at this stage, even Petrobras doesn't know. Okay, so we need to wait and see. I mean, we can, you know, we can only observe, okay? So here recently in January, they placed orders for topside modules, you know, totally overseas. Uh, you know, we, we can see the logic, okay? If they really ban those contractors, they have to go somewhere else. And so then, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it it's very possible that they will do, but it's data. There's nobody in this room that can know what they will decide. You know, we'll find out. I think what's, what's clear is that the, the production profile uh, required takes priority over the local content. Yes. And so they'll be flexible in local content to, to achieve the growth needed. And, and, and there it says is it's happened before. They have multiple times before made exceptions. Okay, when they really needed something, then suddenly they've made exceptions. So if they do that, then they'll be, but exactly how it's going to be, we don't know. Yeah. Okay, uh, more questions, yes. Hi, um, I'm Geeta, I'm from Sidwin. Um, um, I just heard Thail's view on China. I have one question. Um, looking at the profitability of uh, the projects with the current oil price, um, would China, um, what would be the strategic position of China? Is it only going to be cost competitive? How long can they be cost competitive? And um, is it also availability of skilled manpower there? What's the future looking like there? Frederick, you, you've got uh, a lot of Chinese experience. Perhaps you'd like to answer that one. <laughs> I mean, uh, you can only look at the situation in the moment, but uh, th there is uh, a big force behind China, and uh, the, the cost differential today is quite big between... Uh, so we have seen projects where we had budget prices 50% uh, higher from uh, Korea than China on an entire FPSO. And of course, this is situation dependent. It may be related to their appetite for the project, so you cannot take that with two lines under the answer. But it's significantly less um, uh, lower cost in China. The other thing is the capacity and the, the, the national strength behind it. It was mentioned here, the financial financing part here and the financing you can get from uh, with, with backing from uh, Sinusure with the Chinese National Construction Bank, it's just, uh, it's just the best you can get. And uh, that's very attractive to get all the, the financing during your, um, your construction. So you get down to 1090, maybe even 595 on, uh, on the financing, and uh, that's very attractive. So there is a lot to it. But you've seen the development in Korea, and uh, it's likely to go the same way, way over the year and flatten out. And we had Japan there at one point of time. So, so these things are changing over time. I agree with you. But, uh, I would like to add, because you know, I, when I first started doing a project, uh, an FPSO in China in 2002, Costs were incredibly cheap. Uh, skill level was fairly moderate, but very concentrated. Okay, around 2005, this changed because so many people opened new shipyards and fab yards, and 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 so the competence <coughs> is actually very scattered in China, and you need to wait. I'm not saying it's bad, but it is much less concentrated. It used to be a handful of places in 2002 where all the competence was and then there was nothing else. Now you have some competence left, right, and they're building up their own. But I would say that, uh, uh, you know, having been there in 2000, 2005 to 2004 and then 2006 to 2008 and we've had conversions there, is, is actually the cost has gone up. It's still competitive, but it has gone up. It's not ridiculous anymore you know I 
just as an anecdote, in 2002, I went for, you know, somewhere in China to do basic design of a hull, and I was told it was $15 an hour for everybody. Coffee lady, project director, sure, I took it, you know. This was the cheapest design I'd ever done. This doesn't exist anymore. And, and, and so the costs have gone up. Um, the competence is far more distributed, which means you have to spend the effort to find it. And, and definitely, uh, there is not the depth behind, okay? You know, their, their demography has changed, and you can see it. Uh, so uh, they, you know, there are yards that have problems attracting personnel. Uh, and, and so actually, you know, the Chinese are changing fairly. Their advantage is not going to be forever. It's, it's eroding. And uh, I, I personally, I think that the best time to go there for modules was probably uh, 2006 to 2008, if you knew how to manage it. You can still go and people go, but uh, you can't get as big a difference as we did then. Mike, anything to add from your experience in China? I think, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think the, the question was maybe also referring to engineering. Um, but uh, one thing we we have not done is, is uh, detailed engineering in China. Um, there are other places we prefer to go uh, yeah. um, because there is you're not just looking for for price; you're looking for quality. It's got to be right. So um, that's where we uh, we tend not to to do engineering in China. Yeah. yeah so and I've done it twice, and it's very very hard. Yeah. It's very hard because more harder than anywhere else. Is, is uh, to get quality engineering done in China, you just need to spend a lot of money. It's just it's from a personal uh, personal observation. Um, if I can turn the question slightly slightly the other way around, I think one of the issues we're seeing um, globally is not just what's happening in China, but what's happening elsewhere. Um, I had a conversation uh, last week. I had lunch with a, a shipbroker, and he was saying that uh, uh, increasingly they're seeing other yards. Uh, responding to, to to the gap between East Asian yards, particularly China, and uh, <coughs> and their own prices, and and the one area that he focused on, which was for, for vessels at the bottom end of the range, we're all talking about, uh, is Europe, and uh, we're seeing prices coming out of Europe that are significantly cheaper than we've seen probably for the last, in relative terms, probably for the last thirty or forty years. Um, partly it's the euro, which is which is you know is, is now becoming a um, a, a slightly um, a slightly embattled currency um, and, and the relationship not only between between the euro and the dollar but the euro and other currencies combined with deflation um, in uh, in particularly in southern Europe is leading some of the southern European yards to offer um, quite good prices now they don't have the same track record they don't have the same scale um, but they do have a couple of issues in terms of proximity to market and so forth so I don't think it's. I think it's just what's going to happen in China. I think what we're seeing is the whole of shipbuilding having to refocus. And I think when you you were, you were showing your forecast of shipbuilding activities, we're seeing a lot of the the, the the drilling boom coming off as well. Some of the other yards are going to have to fill their capacity to uh, to make up that shortfall. So, right. I think we've got time for for one more question before lunch, and then uh, then we'll uh, we'll draw it to a close. Yes, there was a gentleman there putting his hand up before. Uh, Nils Hermann Kjær from the Norsk Olje Selskap. Just a question about uh, conversions versus new build. Um, the good old hulls from the early days, they are more or less gone. Uh, you talk about high prices for new conversion candidates. Uh, are these hulls as good as you want them to be? Or uh, is this also driving uh, you towards more new build? I think um, the, the CSR rules uh, made a big difference and uh, leveled the playing field. So if you go for post-CSR, uh, the tankers are, uh, are a good starting point for conversion. Hassan? Yeah, yeah um, uh, you're talking about my steel versus uh, high tensile steel. The, the new vessels, uh, if you use them in Africa, they're as good as any, to be honest with you, because of the mild uh, environment. But if you are brave enough to use them uh, in the North Sea, for example, we had a on the Kraken job, uh, a designer, with the, we don't want to mention the name, uh, they did an analysis and they decided to remove the entire top deck uh, because of the thickness of the, uh, of 
of the plates. And what we had to do was re-engineer it uh, twice, thrice, uh, to basically put additional uh, supports in between instead of the flexible, just simple supports. So it does pose challenges uh, in severe environment, but I can't see that in Africa or even in Asia. I think they're as good as, as, as any other one. Uh, obviously, you need to know the condition of the, of the vessel and the trade in history. So you, you need, really need to know your ships first. But otherwise, I don't know if you concur with me, there's no real difference, right? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, it's now, uh, we've now reached lunchtime, so it just remains for me to, uh, to thank the panel, Hassan, Michael, Teal, and, uh, and Frederick, for all their contributions. Thank you.